Uh, okay, I'll get started. Um, so as Kavitha said, my name is Ronick Butch. I'm a PhD student in the Parallel Programming Laboratory here at the University of Illinois. And my talk will be on vector load balancing and charm. Um, a lot of this stuff ties into other things that Phil just talked about and the questions I was asking to him. Um, so in the interest of time, I'll go a little fast, but feel free to stop me if you have any questions and obviously I'll take some more at the end. Okay, so before we get into the, the crux of vector load balancing, let's talk just about load balancing first of all. So load balancing is the hallmark of Charm++ as everyone here of course knows. One of the big things that load balancing does is minimize the maximum load on a PE. In lots of applications, performance is often limited by that. And when you do an iteration, you're constrained by these laggards until you go to the next one. So the way that this generally works in Charm is that the RTS will automatically measure load, store that in some database, feed that to strategies, and then the strategies will make some decisions and migrate objects based on that load that it saved in response to the decisions it's made. This has especially helped over the years for dynamic and irregular applications. We've demonstrated hundred, hundreds and thousands of cores of scaling for lots of these applications and can achieve really, really high performance and scalability that without any, some form of load balancing, they would not be able to achieve in the first place. But really at the end of the day, we don't really care about load imbalance necessarily. What we really care about is performance. And in truth, uh, in my perspective at least, load is really just a proxy value that we use to reason about performance. At the end of the day, we wanna minimize execution time or time to solution. And realistically, I'd personally rather have an unbalanced fast program than a balanced slow program or balanced as some function of utilization. The thing is that what we call load is often a very, very good uh, indicator of this performance that we're talking about. And in lots and lots of cases, CPU time measured per object just by itself is often a sufficient metric for this value. But there are lots of cases that we've seen where in the same way that when you look at profilers that we can measure cache misses or pipeline installs or things about the hardware, where that's shown big improvements over just merely running a CPU profiler. And in that same vein, collecting more than just the CPU load information can really be helpful for certain applications. So that's essentially what we're doing. That's what vector load balancing is for us. So rather than just being a single value, which traditionally has just been the CPU load, load is now a vector of multiple values. So how we've integrated this in the charm, we've had to make a few changes to the infrastructure. We've had to store vector loads in the LB database pass these vector loads into strategies, use them in the strategies to make decisions. Um, but we've done all that now, so now Charm is able to use these vector loads to make better decisions. And when we talk about vector loads, these vector loads can be filled with really any data. So we can use these sort of generically. We can use them for various hardware measurements, such as CPU time or GPU time or memory capacity or network send, things like that. We can use this to describe discrete parts of an iteration so like the subfaces that Phil, for example, was just talking about, or perhaps application specific parameters that could correlate with the performance of what your application looks like that normally we as a runtime couldn't get access to. So there are some difficulties that come with this. One of the big things is that the extra dimensionality with vectors makes load balancing really, really hard computationally. Um, it's already an NP complete problem, even in one dimension. So we're only interested in approximations, but especially as dimensions grow, a notion of what load uh, should go to what location becomes very, very hard. One of the big reasons why this is, is that objects can no longer be totally ordered. And we still wanna minimize this, the maximum each dimension because we think that is gonna improve performance, but figuring out where to place these things can be quite difficult. And we often can't use the same sort of data structures and techniques we've used in the past. So we need new strategies to address these problems. One really simple thing we can do is just sort of this version of the greedy LB that we have in Charm, where we find the object with the global maximum load dimension. So we look through all the dimensions of every object and see which one has the biggest value in one of its dimensions. Pick that object and then place it on the PE with the minimum load across all the PEs in that dimension. So this works well but really only works well when the object has load in just one dimension, because we only consider one at a time when we're looking at balancing. So for more realistic cases, we have to consider the, the whole vector holistically. We have to look at both the object and the processors and how, the, how they mesh together and see how that increases the 
total load by some sense. So we have to kind of step back and look at everything at once. So there are a few ways of doing this as well. So we have a lot of different ideas about how to do this well, and it's still sort of a, a research problem on our end, but I'll describe to you two of the solutions we've come up with so far. One thing we can do is to find the object with the maximum P norm um, for some P, place on the PE with minimum P norm after placement. This works really well because we ensure that none of the dimensions of the vector grows too big, but it can be computationally quite expensive. We have to do a lot of, uh, you have to do a lot of math with powers. And the other big trouble is that the PE weight often varies with an object. For example, the two norm of a PE with load two zero is less than the two norm of a PE with load zero three. But if we have the object three zero, placing that is actually better on the one that has a larger weight than the smaller weight. So using the traditional greedy heuristics doesn't really work here in terms of cutting off where to look at. Usually we just use a heap. We can't necessarily do that anymore. Another technique is to calculate the average load vector across all of the objects and processors and put that as a point in D space where D is the number of dimensions we're working with. Use that, create a, a normal hyperplane at that point, and then repeatedly just iteratively allow the furthest PE below that hyperplane to choose an object to get closer to that average every time. So this also can be computationally difficult um, for largely the same reasons as I just described, but sort of the hill climbing approach to get to some sort of equilibrium. So we have some ideas on how to optimize these things. They work, but they're kind of slow right now. Um, a lot of the other issue, a lot of the other strategies we've come up with are sort of things in this vein. And it's quite difficult to do these things when you have to consider all these different aspects of a load vector. So more logistically speaking, in support of all these things, we have to add some new APIs to Charm to support uh, vector loads. So one thing I'll mention, the terminology is slightly confusing with Phil's talk just now. What he calls subphases, we just call phases. And as you've seen in uh, his example, and as you can, I'm sure, uh, figure out from other applications, a lot of applications will have these orthogonal phases within an iteration, separated by barriers or sometimes some kind of weaker synchronization. So in order to support these in Charm++, we've added some new functions to track phase information. So we have a function called CKLB set phase, which takes the integer phase. And basically what that does is until the next time you call this function, every time the runtime system measures uh, load, that load is attributed to that phase of that object. So we can automatically do this. Basically, the user just has to make these one single calls. They can also query for the current phase using CKLB get phase. So this should hopefully be an easy on-ramp for people who have applications that look like this. Separately, we have a way of doing this all manually. So we've also added an API for recording vector load data where you can, that the user can fully specify. So that looks like this. We have the CKLB set obj time where you can submit a load that's of LB real type. It's basically a float or a double and a dimension specifying which dimension of the vector you want that load to go into. Uh, you can also, of course, query that. So this lets you add in application specific parameters. If you have measurements of the number of particles on a GPU, for example, and you can use that as a metric for your GPU load, you can put that in directly. So this lets you do whatever you want, essentially. So once we've tied all those things into the database, another thing we have to do is of course, use that data to make informed decisions. So a couple of notes with that. One is that currently only strategy is built on top of the new tree LB support vector load balancing. A tree LB is this new load balancing, new, new load balancer coming out in Charm 611. If you want more information about it, you can see our previous workshop talks and the documentation right now has been updated to, uh, to reflect what that is. But uh, in just in, in summary, it's this new sort of flexible optimized replacement of central LB and hybrid LB. So it lets us make these hierarchical structured trees that let us run load balancing at various parts of the job topology with various frequencies and things like that. Eventually, we plan on migrating all of the non-distributed strategies into TreeLB. Uh, at some point in the future, of course, we'll get vector load balancing working with distributed strategies as well. But as of right now, you have to use TreeLB for the current charm support. And the way that it's constructed right now if the runtime system detects a vector load in the LB database at all, 
then it automatically uses a vector version of the chosen strategy. And this relies on templates, as we'll see in a few slides. So another thing is, of course, writing these vector strategies. So I've described to you some of the algorithms we've used, but let me talk to you about how we actually construct them. And if the user wants to, they can do them. They can do this themselves as well, if you want custom load balancing strategies that use vectors. So the object and PE types that we use inside these strategies are templated on the dimension. And then that's externally accessible. There's a static const extra field inside that lets you extract that dimension. If you want to query the load of one of those objects, there's this get load function where you can pass the dimension and you get the load back for that dimension. And as I said, the template specializ you can use template specialization to allow uh, the, the author of the LB to handle these different vector or non-vector cases or specific dimensions. So here's a quick example of that. So this is how strategies that use PLB look. Essentially, they inherit from this public strategy, which is templated on object, processor, and solution. And here we see that in this top version, we have a vector implementation that uses the generic template uh, parameter O. Down below, we have a scalar implementation. This is a partially specialized version of this class. And you see that we're specializing on object one, which means we're doing objects with just one dimension. Uh, we assume that the processor also has one dimension in this case, but we don't need to separately template on that. So this lets me, as a load balancing uh, developer, write my scalar implementation separately from my vector implementation. If I wanted, I could have a specific two-dimensional implementation or a three-dimensional implementation or whatever I'd want. OK, so now a few performance plots. Uh, these will mostly use basic benchmarks. So these are hypothetical applications that we've designed uh, to test these vector load balancing features. So first off, an AMPI. This is a timeline view of an application with no load balancing. On the x-axis, we have time. On the y-axis, we have PE. So as you can see here, the red represents computation, and these blank white spots represent idle time. So you see we have a lot of idle time in this application, and we have these sort of distinct phases of different size and different PEs. When we use regular load balancing, we see that the load balancing period happens right around here. And we see that on the right side, we do have better utilization and better balance of the load on all the PEs. But we still have these gaps in these phases. If we use vector load balancing, which is cognizant of the particular separate phases on each PE, you see how the gaps have shrunk because we now at the load balancer level know that when we place an object somewhere that it contributes to these particular phases. So this is an overview of the, the previous three slides. As you can see, we have the LB off, the phase and aware, and the phase aware versions of load balancing. And we get a 1.44x speed up from regular load balancing compared to the to using no load balancing at all. But using a phase aware load balancer, we get a 1.67 times speed up compared to no load balancing at all. So for this uh, contrived application, granted, we do see this big boost in performance. Another view on the same thing. So we designed another Tron application that does effectively the same thing, where we have distinct phases of chars. And now for another view of it, we're using time profile here, which on the x-axis is time, on the y-axis is total processor utilization. So here again, when we don't use a load balancer at all, we see that we have a lot of idle time up top. When we do use load balancing, we do get spikes up to 100% utilization, but then we get a lot of gaps uh, in between these phases because the phases themselves aren't well balanced. But when you use the vector version of this greedy load balancer, we get much, much closer to 100% utilization after the load balancing uh, decisions have been made halfway through this execution. So again, uh, it's clear that in these test applications that we do get a lot of benefit from using vector load balancing and these new strategies we've developed. So of course, those are all kind of simplified benchmarks. Really what we want to do is get these in working uh, order with real applications. So I personally have started to do this for a couple of our larger applications. So I have a working version of all this vector LB stuff tied into Changa. I don't have performance results at scale yet, so I don't have plots for what that looks like, but the, all the load information is being recorded and the strategies are running in this vector mode. For Changa, it, it, there's a very good mapping between the structure of the application and vector load balancing. Changa uses something called multi-time stepping, 
And in multi-time stepping, we have different rungs of the application in which uh, different parts of this domain are active. So we can very easily map the time spent in each rung of multi-stepping to a dimension in this load vector, and then use that to make informed decisions about where to place things. One of the problems right now is that it's also very important to minimize communication in these sorts of applications and make sure that objects are mapped to the same PE or nearby PEs. And right now, none of our vector load balancers take that into account. So that's something that we certainly have to add, but that's something I'm also actively working on. For another angle on uh, vector load balancing, I'm also doing the same thing for NAMD. So NAMD is a different sort of application. Of course, it's a molecular dynamic simulation, but it, it uses uh, CUDA very, very effectively. And one of the things we'd like to do for NAMD is to balance both CPU and GPU load to be able to make sure that it works well for applications regardless of what the hardware resource is. So that's something I'm, I'm actively in the process of doing and measuring right now. For anyone else out there, if you think that your application would benefit from vector load balancing or it has some characteristics that we can exploit with this, please contact me. I would love to hear from other Charm users that can use this. So to talk quickly about some future vector LB work, one of the issues that I mentioned before is that we have these strategies that seemingly work well, that do this holistic consideration of the problem domain, but performance is still a bit of an issue, so we need some optimizations. So we have a lot of ideas in this vein, things like discretization, doing some candidate style clustering, making space partitioning, uh, using some space partitioning style data structures to figure out where to pick certain objects. And that should all go quite a long way. I think that'll decrease a lot of our complexity and help us with these selection processes a lot. Another thing that we're trying to do is exploit the distribution of load per dimension. What can often happen in applications like this is that certain dimensions have, are very, very sparse, where most of the objects have zero load in that dimension, but some have uh, some high amount of loads. So this, this can happen, for example, with Changa and its runs. So we can reduce the dimensionality of the whole problem and ensure that we have a good uh, balance for objects with that dimension when we try to exploit this distribution. Another thing, as I mentioned with uh, NAMD to some degree, we have this accelerator API called HAPI that Jamin kind of mentioned in his talk earlier today. One thing we'd like to do is integrate HAPI into load measurement to automatically record accelerator load so that any charm users who use HAPI to use CUDA or other accelerators will automatically have the, uh, um, the load information for their kernels attributed to their objects and put into this that uh, put into the vector load balancer so that we can more effectively balance CPU and GPU work. Another thing is to add support for constraint-based objective functions. So far, we've just been talking about minimizing this load, but really we don't necessarily need to do that for applications that uh, rely on uh, cache locality or that have uh, capacity constraints on memory. We really, we really just need to keep this below some threshold to ensure we're able to fill uh, the physical capacity of what the machine is and not go past that. So that can simplify some of these strategies in the future. So in conclusion, we've seen that applications have a lot of scope for improved load balance, especially looking forward as hardware gets more complex and programming techniques get more complex. Proving, providing that more detailed load data that we've been able to do via vector LB has been shown to improve this decision quality over the more opaque uh, traditional LB in testing. So looking forward, I think this is going to be a, a necessary part of complex applications to ensure that they maintain scalability and high performance. That's all I have, but I'll gladly take questions. Thanks. Uh, I had a question about um, the, I guess, the goals of load balancing. Like, like you mentioned at the beginning, the, the ultimate goal is to just get faster performance. You don't care, quote unquote, what the balance looks like. Uh, but does that uh, simplify things? Like you talked about vector load balancing in general, where mm -hmm. components of your load might be like CPU time and GPU time, where the load balancers have no inherent knowledge of how those times overlap or what the dependencies between those things are. Whereas when you're looking at phase-based in particular, like Phil kind of mentioned in his talk, the total application time is the sum of those, how long it takes each phase to execute. So since you have sort of a more concrete goal in the phase-based system, is there more 
you can do in load balancing strategies to specifically target that that should simplify the problem or is it still to generate to like a pretty general case? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I'm not sure exactly. Um, I've done some thinking and some testing in that vein. What we're doing now, especially for the CPU GPU case where things can overlap or other cases where we don't have these strict barriers between phases or between dimensions, we're probably solving a more difficult version of the problem than we have to um, because we're considering that we want to minimize every single dimension when really we could just minimize the maximum potentially of each, uh, of each vector, which would reduce us down to sort of the scalar problem in some sense. I think the solution that we have is still, we'd still produce a good solution for it, but we might be doing extra work. So to get to the crux of your question, yeah, if we can figure out a way of exploiting exactly what our objective function is, given the data and given what our application looks like, we might be able to simplify some of the strategies. I'm not sure quite how to do that yet, but if we could find good ways, then that's something that I think we should certainly add. And if, if I can, if I may add, the um, the in some cases, the what we need to do is simpler. Of uh, some of the dimension don't quite collapse; they they are there, but they combine in a different way. And the best example I can think of is the memory constraint, right? Or same thing applies to communication volume constraint. But if you want to keep the memory occupancy of each node below some constraint, it doesn't really matter. It's a capacity constraint. It, you're not trying to balance it. You're not trying to equalize it. You're trying to fit within the memory of, of that node uh, by not allocating it objects that don't do much computing but occupy a lot of memory. So one can do that by just simply keeping track of it up to some point uh, in your whatever heuristic you're using. So there are algorithms get kind of modified, if not simpler, they are less complex than this multidimensional optimization, but they still require some modification. I don't know if that connected with the question properly, but, yeah. but just consider those cases is what I'm saying. Memory, communication injection, uh, mm -hmm. old, old problem in charm greedy algorithm uh, strategies used to be that the greedy algorithm just goes, assigns the heaviest objects to the least loaded processor in a cycle. And towards the end, it is dealing with a whole bunch of lightly loaded uh, light objects. But those all those light objects are not adding much work to the same least loaded processor. So the same one gets selected and you add a whole bunch of tiny objects on, on it. And those tiny objects end up doing communication. And so that was creating problems. So it's uh, these kinds of problems that a vector balancer needs to address as well. Right. Any other questions, I guess? Didn't Phil have questions? In the Google Doc, I see Phil has two questions there. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess the, uh, the big question I have that kind of spans all of these is um, you, you talked about uh, writing kind of generic strategies, uh, you know, that are independent of the number uh, or the dimensionality of the vector. But it seems that with different, different metrics, uh, you know, having different physical dimension, you know, memory versus time versus communication, or time measured on two different, yep. you know, kinds of device heterogeneous time between CPU and GPU. Um, it would seem that like a generic strategy that doesn't know what dimension, you know, what, what physical uh, unit a given dimension represents uh, won't really be able to make sense of that, except in a very abstract, you know, like hyperplane cut kind of sense that you described as one heuristic strategy. Yeah, that's a good point. One thing that we basically do now is normalize everything, uh, which makes it invariant in terms of units, but potentially gives more importance to things that don't deserve it. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that, 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 it's very true. And part, part of the idea behind this is that we can create these generic strategies, 
but they may or, they may or may not be universally applicable. So I, the slide that you presented, in fact, where you're talking about these different forms of combination and filtering of what the load looks like before it reaches um, things in the slides you had about models, something like that could be very useful here too, where you sort of have this pre-conditioning phase where we send the load through something to filter it down to the set of things that the user deems important. Yeah, um, I've also looked at um, some notion of like whether it might be worthwhile to try normalizing loads in some fashion, scaling them by you know the max or the average or something like basically to make mm -hmm. the load representation scale invariant in right. some way, just to figure out whether that would help any aspect of the process. Um, and ne never really got anywhere. So if you if you get traction on that, I look forward to hearing about it. Yeah, I, I don't I don't necessarily have a good reason to do it empirically. Um, some of the literature in this vein does that already, but it's much more concerned from a theoretical perspective than a practical one. Yeah. So yeah, I, I don't know if that's actually going to be beneficial or not in in real life, but that's what we're doing right now. So once we get stuff working at scale with, with NAMD and Changa or other applications, then we'll certainly see if that has an impact. Cool, thanks. And treating different dimensions differently, ways of combining different dimensions differently is definitely part of my agenda. <laughs> and uh, therefore it, like will, it will be Ronex too. <laughs> yeah, it looks like there's another question or two uh, in the Zoom chat from uh, from Niels and uh, Francois Gilbert. Uh, I thought those were older questions. No. Oh no, they are new no, questions. Uh, okay. My my question is sort of fairly general, and and, and it's sort of uh, would it be helpful, or is there a way we can supply the connectivity graph and weights for it to trump plus plus for load balancing? It's it's somewhat tangential, but like in our case, we know exactly how what the connectivity is between all of the chars and how much communication there will be how often they communicate and everything we know that's sort of a priori i realize trend plus plus measures all of this but um I, my thought process is sort of from a follow-up to francois talk is could we give this information before we start the simulation to trend plus plus and do a more expensive load balancing procedure that tries to minimize communication or something like this. Um, so, so somehow this, this issue has fallen. Uh, people are thinking of this, I don't, and I want to understand why, Ronak, as something new. This is something that we have always had at, right? Parametis, Scotch, there is actually a whole bunch of stuff we did, did on Scotch exactly for this reason, doing a graph load balancer to begin with. And then after that, you can just do normal refinement, which will hopefully keep things uh, care carefully. But also you can do prefix based balancer, which somehow again has fallen off our uh, distribution looks like. And uh, or uh, Kavita's, uh, well, Kavita implemented it, it's some uh, European uh, uh, paper idea, which is the refinement of graph, which is not different, not that different than something I heard today from I mean, at least overlaps with something I heard from Lercio uh, about, uh, seems like graph uh, uh, refinement of some sort. So Rona, can you say something about the state of software and why these questions are arising and what's your opinion about that overall? And Kavita can yeah, check into if you want. It, it, it's a good question for sure. Um, we do support, oh. like Sanjay was saying, these different graph refinement or graph partitioning style balancers, Zoltan, Scotch, Metis. And not only these, these, I believe, are all in the documentation and should be working, at least as some of them are tested. I don't think Scotch is because it's external, but I believe the other two are, and they should be working fine with, with Charm, uh, last I know. Um, but yeah, I think it's probably a question of what we're recommending. I think largely educationally, we're, we certainly talk about these more basic load balancers and like greedy and things in that vein. And maybe the there's just an awareness problem with the the other ones. Yeah. So I mean, for our from for us, sort of, we couldn't get uh, the Scotch one to work at all, and the Metas one kept keep seg faulting on us, uh -huh. um, and it, this makes it very difficult to use, obviously. Uh, yeah. And, and the course. other thing we sort of have found to sort of I think that answers Sanjay's question of why does this keep coming up 
it's sort of documented, but not well. And, and I realize writing good documentation is super difficult. So this is, you know, not, you know, this is sort of asking, could, could, would it be possible to put some, some effort on, on that front? Because that's sort of what we have found the most difficult with load balancing is reading the documentation, figuring out what guarantees we mm -hmm. have um, and, and which load balancers <laughs> to sort of use given what we want to do or what we know or in, in different situations. And so I, I, I would I be surprised I, I if got it's 99% from... documentation. Yeah. I, I think I understand the problem. We'll, we, we will do, take steps to fix it. I think part of the reason also is over time, the set of applications we use uh, starts homing on to either their own or start finding some greedy or some simple thing good enough. And then they stop paying attention and those strategies again, start gathering dust. Uh, so we need to, we need to get back uh, and do a good job of it. Yeah, I think largely the problem is just that it was mostly older grad students who since graduated who've worked on those things. <laughs> and then since then, that. yeah. yeah. But I, I agree, like there, we should get them working because all the machinery is in place. And if, if you can't use them, then it's clearly failing on our part. So that's something we, we should fix. Yeah, I mean, it's, so my, my advisor has said it uh, very well that the problem with grad students is that they graduate, so. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I sympathize with you know maintaining. As a professor, I'm very well aware of that problem. Yeah, yeah. So it's yeah, it's, it's not well recognized by the student community. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> okay, enough enough on that. Let's let's move on.